I'm supposed to wear this thing. <clears throat> Forgive me, because my voice is very, very weak. And if you can't hear me, please say so. I don't know what I can do about it, but at least say so. Uh, OK, hopefully everything is OK. <clears throat> you cannot hear me. Dick and Mark, they cannot hear me. <laughs> There are seats here, by the way. That's a solution. Yeah. Uh, Let me, uh, and they're all going to go uh, from the uh, volume. So OK. <clears throat> oh. Well, while they correct this, it doesn't really matter if you hear this. It may be better if you don't hear this. Now we are hearing it. Does it? It may be. Good for everybody? I think, I think if I leave it here. Is this OK? I'll just hold it like this. It's fine. It will give me something to hold on to as, <laughs> as I sweat before you all. Um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I, I am here, and this is no exaggeration, almost entirely out of love and gratitude for a few people. And I want to express that gratitude to Father Evan, especially now that he's not here because I'm not sure he realizes how important he actually is in the life of our monasteries. Um, I don't even think he's come to us. I don't think he's ever been to either Mal or Iona. But it was because of a conversation with him many years ago that I actually started recording our podcast for Ancient Faith Radio. I was set against doing anything like that because I thought, first of all, I'm going to be completely rubbish at it. And secondly, who needs them? And he explained to me very carefully and very patiently, we were on a pilgrimage together to the Republic of Georgia, and he explained to me why it's necessary both for the monastery and, well, for orthodoxy at large. And if he hadn't reached out at that moment, I'm not certain that our monasteries would actually be alive today, especially given the horrible years that we've just survived of the pandemic. Because the only way we can survive is by me traveling to meet you or you coming to meet us in our own monasteries. And in those years, that couldn't happen. So the only way for us to literally survive was to act online, either through podcasts or those videos. We owe more than we can express to Father Evan. And then, of course, Father Deacon Mark, who has been the treasurer of our monasteries for, I think, the last six or seven years. That's a lot of work to put in voluntarily with nothing to expect except maybe God's grace and gratitude. I, I, I can't say anything else except thank you and I've got nothing else to offer except my prayer for him and Aina and, and their family. And what makes it difficult to be here apart from being in the presence of all of you is that here I am talking to you and I'm supposed to say something that's meaningful and useful, while in the audience we've got someone who's been in a monastery for much, much longer than I have been alive. So if you've never met Mother Cassiana, she's hiding over there. She made me promise not to draw attention to her. <laughs> so, so I'm going to need your help to survive Mother Cassiana after this. But. In all honesty, I wish she were not here because I say this every opportunity I have, even when she's not here. I've been in a monastery for about 20 years. Mother has been for over 50 years. That's almost a decade more than my entire life. And she's very humble about it. She's not going to teach you anything. She might even seem grumpy sometimes. But if you give Mother the love and the patience and the prayer, there is a lot to learn. And I should know because I've known her for almost my entire monastic life. God brought Mother and Archbishop Benjamin into my life about five years before I had left my monastery in Moldavia and I knew that I needed support from over here. And now both these wonderful human beings are pillars and founders of our monasteries. And this is a very, very rare opportunity for me to say thank you, Mother, in front of, of everyone. All right, before I start saying something, 
I have begged some of you, and I'm doing it publicly to all of you. If you have any questions, spiritual or about recipes, please ask them. <laughs> ask them because I dread being here and pretending like I have something to offer to you. But after I'm going to say something for about 15, 20 minutes, you will get to ask questions. And I have learned in these years of meeting people that it's not about me offering you something or you offering me something. It's in that moment when we meet in a question that something sometimes happens, something that resembles almost a, a sacrament, a mystery of two people coming together and that's where Christ is as well. So if you do have a question at any given time, please make a note of it on your phones or whatever you use to remind yourself of things and do ask them at the end. I, I crave for that interaction because that's where I learn from and that's where I grow from. I could very well be on Mal or on Iona recording something. But with you here, the real opportunity is that we meet somehow in a real, in a real sense. So hold on to your questions. I've made some notes. It's not really, I'm not going to read, but they are notes because I panicked. So I woke up this morning at three in the morning and I made some notes and I'll just, you know, allow them to, to guide me somehow today. The topic of this retreat should be loosely walking with Christ in our daily life, learning to live, living with Christ in our daily life. And I had a big issue actually with that from the very beginning, and my original plan was to simply bypass the topic and talk about something else. But the big problem that I had with the topic from the very beginning is that as a monastic, I know what I should tell you. I know that what the parish would benefit from and what you would benefit from would be for me to come and tell you, please throw yourselves into anything, into the deeds of the faith. Go and feed the hungry. Go and welcome the strangers. And if your heart uh, you know, inclines you that way, go and help, I don't know, fight against abortion. Go and fight against guns that kill more people in America than everywhere in the world. Or go and do something for this world, this climate of ours, which are, we, we are destroying every moment of our lives. Go and do things. And the do's of this world are absolutely vital and essential for our salvation. We, we have to do something. And it is true that every one of us has a calling for something more than anything else. I know exactly what I would be doing if I were not a monastic. I'm not going to share it with you, but I know exactly what I would be doing if I were not a monastic. The problem with defining our life that way through what we do as necessary and as formative as that is, is that we end up picking and choosing bits of the gospel. You end up selecting what speaks to your heart and neglecting everything else. And as you do that, the temptation for, I think, most of us is to end up creating a new teaching. Because there will be part of Christ's teaching that we dislike. It goes against our cultural beliefs, or our social beliefs, our political beliefs. Or it's simply too difficult, or it simply makes no sense. And there will be other parts that make sense to you, and that you feel you benefit from. And that applies to every single one of us. And the issue is that if we go about defining our life in Christ that way, each of us is basically rewriting the gospel. And we are rewriting the gospel according to our own weaknesses and our own passions. And in effect, what we are doing is we are creating a new God. Every single one of us, if we go about defining our life in Christ this way, every single one of us will end up creating a new God. Instead of us being formed according to the image of God, instead of this upward spiritual movement, what happens is that we look at God and we amputate the parts that we find difficult in him, and we emphasize the parts with which we agree. We, we sieve, we filter the truth that he's given us, the truth that he is, and we end up with this amputated version of God, which is no longer God, 
but we still give ourselves to that truth. And if you don't think that this is a real danger, just look at the reality of the world today and where we got. Where in your country, because I'm here, I'll give you an example, you have people who will give their life to fight abortion, but at the same time, they couldn't care less that other people are dying of hunger or who will oppose refugees, although Christ has told us to welcome our homes to them. There, there will be people on the other side who are all for welcoming refugees and helping people who are poor and all of that, but who don't give, you know, what, for unborn children. You know what strikes me? That both sides and all these millions and millions of people think that they worship Christ, think that they are Christian. When in fact what they have done, and this is the temptation for all of us, is they've done exactly, as they've gone exactly through the process I've described. They went through the gospel and they selected the parts with which they find it easy to agree. And then instead of forcing yourself, not necessarily to agree because you can't lie to God, but at least to be open and honest about the fact that you can't understand everything in your prayer to God. They simply neglected everything else and each side has built a different God. And each side is worshiping a different God. And both sides call this God Christ. And the real danger is that after walking a whole lifetime, with this Christ which we've built in our lives, we might hear those dreadful, dreadful words. You call me Lord, Lord, I tell you I have never known you. That's my worry and that's my pain. And the, the fact that you have these armies of Christ who can no longer come together, who can no longer love together or worship together. The fact that I have met families and parishes that are broken down the middle by the fact that they are worshiping different versions of the truth. And the minute you say that, the minute you accept that there are versions of the truth, you can be certain that no version is actually the truth. The fact that we can no longer love or worship together but we still call all of us, ourselves Christians, show how dangerous this way of defining our Christian life is. It's not about going through the gospel and selecting those parts to which we are naturally inclined to agree and disregarding the others. That's pure idolatry. And Christ is teaching us and warning us about this because he does say at the end of the world they are going to build gods according to their weaknesses, according to their passions. The proper way to follow Christ <clears throat> is to be painfully and constantly naked in your prayer before him and in your witness and confession before him that you simply cannot take everything inside. Saint Sophroni of Essex says that the question of living as a Christian in the world is a false question because it is impossible to live as a Christian in the world. One can only learn how to die as a Christian in the world, not to live. I love St. Sophroni for many, many things, but um, this is one of the, the main ones. <clears throat> it is impossible to live as a Christian in this world for two very simple reasons. First of all, the world cannot contain God. And secondly, we in our fallen states cannot contain God. Think about it. <clears throat> and you will see how a great danger for us today also <clears throat> is to believe that we can somehow recreate this world in a way that resembles heaven. We all believe that that can be done. And a lot of the horrible things we are doing, <clears throat> forgive me, uh, come from this misconception that somehow the world can, can be turned into heavens. The idea that somehow <clears throat> We can force people to live a certain way 
that we some, somehow can force people to live a virtuous life, that we can get people and put them in these mental, spiritual cages, or sometimes physical cages, prisons, in order to stop them from sinning, and that in doing so, we somehow make this world a better place. That is a ludicrous version and vision of what the church is called to do. Because when you put someone in a cage or in prison in order to stop them from committing a sin, it does not remove the sin from their heart. It may very well be that their way out of that sin is to fall into it, to taste of it, and then to return. Have we never heard of the prodigal son? Would that son have been better if the father said, wait a minute, you go in that room, close the room and left him there, would he have grown in humility or repentance or love for his father? Or would he have grown in, in, in just anger and hatred towards everything and everyone? And the other thing we forget is that when we do that, when we punish others for their own weaknesses and sinfulness, we become sinners ourselves. So instead of building a saint, by putting a sinner in a cage, you're actually turning yourself into another sinner. And all of this comes, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for taking All of this comes from this misconception that somehow we can turn this world, this fallen world, into heavens. That is not possible. Saint Sophroni says it very clearly, and saints before him the same. This world, cannot contain God, and this world can never be, become heaven. And the other reason is that we cannot contain God. It's impossible to fully live with Christ, not only because the world we live in is the way it is, but also because we are the way we are. Think of, oh, Siluan is here. Think of Saint Siluan, for instance, who describes the few moments when he experiences the grace of God. And he says that that experience was so intense, so powerful, that had it been prolonged for simply a few fractions of a second more, he would not have survived it. That's God in you, not what we experience. We experience at the level of children because this is who we are. But we have to remain humble in our awareness that what we are given, the grace that we are given, is merely, you know, food for children. The great warriors, the great soldiers of Christ, people like Saint Siluan, they experienced the fullness of God and they could only take seconds of it. Think about it. We talk about living with Christ fully in our hearts, and especially those of us who come from you know, other um, traditions, we are so used to this vocabulary. God told me, or God you know, spoke to me today. Well, people like Saint Siluan are actually afraid when that happens, because the full presence of God in their lives is so out of this world, so powerful, that they could be destroyed by that presence. And this will give you an idea of how far away we are, although we are Christians, from our purpose. Because God did create us so that within ourselves we have the fullness of his presence. And yet, even our saints, our greatest saints, say that had that experience of God been prolonged for a few fractions of a second, they would have died. We cannot sustain the one who gave us being in ourselves. So the first thing I wanted to say today about this idea of living with Christ is that life with Christ here is impossible. It can be given to some chosen ones for fraction, fractions of a second. Saint Sophroni talks about it like, he says if you imagine this wall of darkness, of black darkness, and there are tiny cuts in it, here and there, and there's a light that just breaks through that cut, just enough for a needle to pass through. That's the experience of God that the saints have. And the rest of us, we live in the shadows of the lights that they are given. 
This is not something to, to sadden us. This is something that is supposed to turn our foundation from the sand of self-delusion and pride into a rock of humility. This is our reality. This will be probably our reality for the extent of our lives. Keep moving forward and we shall be saved. So then I want to turn to the other half of what Saint Sophroni said, that it is not possible to live in this world as a Christian. All we can do in this world as a Christian is learn how to die. You know, he doesn't provide much explanation there, but he says it. He actually says it, if a priest were to act truly of Christ in this world, the world would crucify that priest at any given moment of our history. So the first way in which I received this and I understood it was that because of the world, of the, because of the hatred of this fallen world, because of the world's inability to perceive God, the world would hate God and crucify God. And this is true. Christ tells us, if they crucified me, if they hated me, they will hate and crucify you. That is a very, very clear understanding. But then, a few years later, God spoke something else in my heart as well. If we were to become truly Christ-like in this world, it's not only the hatred of the fallen world that would crucify us. We would actually take ourselves willingly on that cross because that is the only vocation of a true Christian. That is the only vocation of someone who follows Christ, someone who is Christ-like. Christ did not get on that cross out of an accident. When he came into the world, he knew very well what needs to happen. And not only that, but he willingly, purposely stepped every miracle that he made towards that cross out of love for this fallen world that would crucify him. And if we are to be followers of Christ, then that's exactly where we would find our own crowns. That would be our vocation as well. So Christ and those who truly become Christ-like, the saints, can only learn to die in this world, first of all because the world cannot take that holiness and will distract them, and secondly because it is Christ's vocation, his will, based on his eternal love for us, to be put up on that cross and be crucified for us, who are the ones crucifying him. I'm not even going to allow myself to contemplate how far away I personally am from that vision. And every time something or a situation triggers, not hatred, but lack of love in me, the idea of putting myself on a cross precisely from the people, for the people who are crucifying me, that is very, very removed, removed from me still. But it is a good kind of criterion to check ourselves where we are. Think of the person who, who has done the most damage in your life, in any way, and imagine yourself if you had the love to allow yourselves to be crucified by those very people who have damaged you already in order to save them. That's the love of God. And that love, which is God himself, can only die in this world. Its only place in this world is on a cross. It's basically the same thing, really. It's basically idolatry, because this happens to us, living and dying with, with God. Um, this happens to us when we fall in that ancient temptation of humanity, which is idolatry. And you'll, you'll hear me return to this again and again. Reading through the Old Testament, 
we are all used to thinking of idolatry in the sense of someone building something, you know, I don't know, a statue, a bronze, a golden statue, and then worshiping that instead of the living, breathing God. But the way we continue to fall into idolatry today, the ways in which we do that are much more subtle and yet just as deadly, spiritually speaking. One is that temptation to amputate Christ and to reshape him into what our passions and our needs want him to be. Another is to place anything or anyone else in that central place in our life which should only belong to Christ. And again, it's easy to understand that if you think of passions. If you think of someone who has an addiction of sorts, someone who's addicted to anything, from drugs to alcohol to pornography to hating someone, any, any passions, any of them that actually become central in your life, that moves over Christ and replaces him in the center of your life, that passion becomes your idol. And the risk is that those who worship idols, we know very well from St. David, from the Psalms, become like them, and they are nothing. But what is most striking to me, and I have seen it in my own life, and in, particularly in the lives of those people who are in the church, it's easy to understand when a passion takes the place of Christ in your life. What's more difficult to understand and to perceive actually is when a virtue replaces Christ in your life. And that can happen and that does happen to many of us. I have seen people, many wonderful people, who have replaced that central place with their careers, for instance. <clears throat> I've seen other people <clears throat> who have put at the center of their lives, not their career, but their family, their spouse, or their children, or someone whom they love or care for or sometimes status, especially if you come to the British Isles, having status, belonging to a certain class, is very important. All these things, <clears throat> although they are virtuous things, I mean, family, children, spouses, work, they are things that God himself has commanded us to do in this life. But if they end up becoming more important to you than Christ himself, then don't lie to your own conscience. You are not walking this life with Christ. You are walking this life alongside your idol, be that your family, be that your career, or whatever it is. And there is that frightening, frightening parable in the gospel about the ones who are called to, to the wedding. The emperor calls them to the wedding, and some of them say, well, I'd like to come, but I can't because I have a new family, I have a wife now. Or I can't come because I have a new ox, I have land, I have to go out and work it. These are blessed things. I could understand these people falling if one of them had said, you know, I'm going, I'm not coming because I'm going out to kill someone, or I'm going out to a prostitute, or I'm going out to steal. These are obvious sinful behaviors. But these people actually say, I'm going out to do something that God himself commanded me to do, to take care of my family, or to work. And yet, even these blessed things, when they are placed at the center of your life and they replace that presence of Christ, they become idols and they will let us empty and nothing at the end of our lives. And we can see that even during the life because a career will last for a while and then it goes away. And a spouse will be with us for a while and then the spouse goes away, either, God forbid, through a divorce or more painful, through death. Our own children, they grow and then they go away. And you are left 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years later with the same searching, the same questions, the same doubts you had at the beginning of your life, only with three, four, five, six decades <clears throat> wasted and without the ability to go back 
and relieve them the proper way. Be very, very careful. Ultimately, this is what I want to say, because it is a great danger that seeking to live truly with Christ, we might replace Christ with these idols, either amputated gods built according to our fallen images, or our passions and our sins, when a passion controls you to the degree that it keeps you away from Christ, that it keeps you away from communing with his sacraments, for example, then know that you are actually there, you are witnessing a battle in your soul. Your soul struggles to decide whether to worship God or to worship the idol of that particular passion. And finally, there is this much more subtle risk and it affects particularly people who have been Christians for a long time and who are good, outwardly good Christians, that we build idols out of our own virtues. You can even build an idol out of your own faith. Orthodoxy itself can become an idol. And I won't get into that unless we have more time, but that in itself can be a risk. When you get so attached to how you define your Orthodox Church, when you get so attached to a certain way of singing, or a certain way of having your icons painted, or a certain way of swinging the incense around, if you end up defining truth through these exterior manifestations of your faith, then you have built yourself another idol that will prevent you from loving your neighbor, loving your brother, and will prevent you from being saved, although you'll spend all your life in that church. Oh. <clears throat> yes, I wanted to finish with a third thought. <clears throat> after telling you that I, I know from my own experience and I have been taught that by the grace of God, by saints like Saint Sophroni, that it actually is impossible to live as Christ, as a Christ-like being in this world. And all you can do, because that is your vocation, is to learn how to die properly as a Christian so that your death itself becomes salvific for everyone else. The reality is that, you see, <clears throat> I have been invited here today. It's, it's a perfect example. I have been invited here today to talk about what it means to live our lives in Christ. When, in fact, the very principle of living with Christ is that you don't make the choices of what this means, but that you follow Christ faithfully, where he will take you. And for us as monastics, <clears throat> this is a very personal and intimate conversation about obedience, ultimately. Because again, I can come here and I can have a conversation with every one of you, and then we can decide together that your way to follow Christ is to do these particular things in your life, when in fact, the only true way to be with Christ is to let him lead you. But very few people, myself included, do that in a natural, easy way. Because, because sometimes Christ takes us in directions that we would never choose. Sometimes Christ allows our path to be very painful to be a path of suffering. I mean, his own path, and he's the one who should be following, led him to the cross. It is possible that, you know, Christ is not going to ask you to be a great warrior against poverty. But he may ask you simply to follow him faithfully and patiently and with love and gratitude. And my God, these are such painful words. As you go through... <clears throat> something like a cancer or someone in your life having a mental illness or someone whom you loved and you've put your whole faith 
and love into that person just betrays you and becomes your enemy. Sometimes Christ allows these paths to be the way forward. And to live one's life with Christ is not to tell him, I'm sorry, this is not what I want to do. This is not my plan. My way for me to have a relationship with you is for me to do these particular things. To follow Christ is one of the most overused and abused expressions in the English language. And I think there are very few people, the saints really, who do that. Because again, we would choose that path according to our weaknesses and our passions. Whereas Christ, who knows a lot more than we know, might choose different paths, paths of solitude and pain and illness for us. And the greatest cross when you're faced with a path of this sort is the pain, but also the lack of understanding, that dreadful, dreadful, stubborn question, why? Why? This need to understand. And this is where this links so intimately with monastic obedience. <clears throat> You can have two brothers approach you and I can tell them the same thing. Go out and water the flowers, although it's been raining for three days. And one of them will ask me why and the other one will say, may it be blessed. And I explain to the one who asked me why, because we need to add some extra nutrition because all that rain has actually drained the nutrition out of the ground and the plants might actually die. And then they both go out and they do their obedience. So you have the same obedience coming from the same person to two different people. And these two people go out and they do the same deed. But only one of them has followed Christ. The one who has said, may it be blessed immediately, without seeking to understand, without seeking explanations. Because behind that tiny little word, why hides the biggest idol of them all, our brains, and our need to understand everything, our need to filter everything that God or the servants of God are asking us to do through our own understanding. It's not that abbots or abbesses enjoy playing God or enjoy tormenting their novices when you ask them to do something that doesn't ring normal or rightful to them. It's that you try to strengthen in them that muscle of obedience. Because if you ask me why, and I explain to you why, you will understand the logic behind it, and then you will move forward, but you are not going to be obedient or a follower of Christ. You are obedient and a follower of your own mind of your own brain, and that, as beautiful as we think that our brain is, is still made of the same flesh as the rest of our bodies, and will be reduced to the same nothingness, the same dust as the rest of our bodies. I know that as a monastic, and I've seen it as an abbot, um, it is a dreadful thing to let go of the safety of your own understanding, to let go of the safety and familiarity of your own brain, and to blindly follow Christ, especially knowing, as we do know, that the vocation, the crown of it all, is not to be positioned somewhere on a high place being appreciated by people, but to be put somewhere in a very humble place, most probably a cross resembling the one of Christ. And the last thing I had on my mind to share with you in this first hour, how long have I been droning on for? I don't know. Uh, the last thing I wanted to tell you is that, you see, I kept talking for however long it's been about trying to escape this temptation of idolatry in all its modern contemporary forms. But the reason why we want that 
obviously, is that we want to follow Christ himself. But for us, is that we are, I'm not sure how to put this in English, we are, we are becoming creatures. We are creatures in the making. We are like, like embryos in this great womb of God, which is this world. We are going to change. We are going to grow. We are going to become something else. And I'll say more about this, God willing, in the next session. We become according to the image of the God we worship. And if you worship an idol, you have already predefined who you become. Because we build the idol. It's, it's a vicious, deadly circle where we build the idol whom we worship, and then we become like that idol. I can give you an example, because thank God, I, 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 I hope I can speak freely with you. On Iona, there is this big, big cathedral, St. Columbus Cathedral, which is a wonderful place because it's built on the place where the first monastery in the 500s was built. And I'm half blind by now. And when I went into the abbey this spring, sometime, I don't know, January, February, I saw at the very end of it, where the altar is, this big painting that I thought was the trinity of St. Andrei Rublyov. And I just ran towards it. I could not believe it. I mean, that's, that's amazing for, for a church in, in, in Scotland where everything is so... I don't know. I don't want to define it. It's not what you would expect in a Christian church in Scotland. And as I approached it, it became clearer to me that that's not St. Andre's uh, uh, Trinity. <clears throat> it is based on the Trinity. It has the same composition. But instead of the three angels that make that perfect circle that say that God is one, the three angels that have identical faces so that we know that the three persons of the Trinity are equal in honor and in glory, but they are distinguished by what they do, the way they are manifested in the world. That's such great theology in St. Andrei Rublev's Trinity. Instead of those angels, you had an angel who was black, another one who was white, and another one who was LGBT. One is a man and two of the others are women. This is the perfect example of what I'm trying to share with you in the hope that you'll be more vigilant in your spiritual life so you don't fall prey to building your own idols. These people who are wonderful people, who sacrifice their, their means, their finances, their time, their efforts in order to keep that place going, they have actually rebuilt redefined, rewritten the truth about the Trinity itself according to what? According to our brokenness and our fallenness. They've taken God himself, the Holy Trinity, and instead of trying to understand the theology of that icon so that by prayer and by effort we might be made in the image of God, They've actually taken God and shaped Him according to our image, according to our fallenness, our brokenness, and our sin. And what happens there is that is actually spiritual suicide. There's no other way to put it. Because we do it to ourselves. We take this living, breathing God who is an act of pure being and love who has already done everything and more than enough for us to be saved, and we reduce this living love act of being to an amputated idol with whom we built according to our weaknesses and sinfulness, then we spend our whole life literally sacrificing giving our time, giving our work, our money, taking our families, offering our children to these gods. And we become like them at the end of our lives. And then we discover that that becoming has actually been becoming into the nothingness out of which the real God had created us. That's spiritual sacrifice. That's spiritual suicide for me. To live with Christ is to give him free reign. 
and to learn to follow him and to pay attention especially when his paths don't ring true to you because that's when he's trying to show something in you. That's when he's trying to point out to the cancers you are supposed to heal in you before our time is done. To live with Christ is to live in the darkness and in the light at the same time. Because you are in the light following him who is light, but you are also in perfect darkness about who you are and how your life will end up being. We are not men and women. We are not young or old. We are not healthy or sick. We are not tall or small and so on and so forth. We are all mysteries. We are all mysteries. God did not create us to be someone's mother or someone's father, to be a lawyer or to be anything else. God created us to be able to live with him in eternity. He created us so we can contain him and be one with him in eternity. Can you see how painfully we have, we have deformed our own vocation? And the only way to live out this mystery, the only way for this potential in us to become a reality is to do that dreadful thing which is called obedience to him and to let go of the reins and allow him to lead us on the path. I never in my wildest dreams wanted or thought about leaving my monastery in Moldavia. Never. And yet... Here I am, in Scotland. I never in my wildest dreams would ever choose to travel for two days and a half to be here with you in order to put myself through this hell. <laughs> Don't laugh, because it actually drains me physically, and I've ended up in hospital doing this thing. I didn't choose this, but I have to do it, because as much as I just as clear as it is to me that this is not what I would choose, there isn't one ounce of doubt in my heart that this is what God wants me to do. I've prayed all my life to live alone, alone with God, and I ended up taking care of two monasteries, and there are ten of us now. I still pray for the same thing, but I put this big word B-U-T, but may your will be done. Because you have to be honest about your weaknesses. You have to be honest in your prayer about what you would like, the way Christ was in Gethsemane. If it's possible, take this away from me. But may your will be done. If we want to one day leave that mystery that we have been created to be, we have to go through this spiritual crucifixion of letting go of our own will, of our own safety nets, and just following blindly in the dark this Christ who is our true light in this world. Forgive me, I have no idea how long I spoke because my phone is still in British time, of course. Um, but if there are any questions, as I told you in the beginning, that's, that's what I value more than, than anything. Dick and Mark will tell us. Thank you. I will give one pound to everyone who has a question. <laughs> First pound. Questions? Thank you, Father. How would we... Hmm. So many of us are equipped with the power to be self-determined with finances or with opportunity. How do we relinquish that without feeling like we're squandering the responsibility to act? Or how do we come into obedience, I should say, within every aspect of our life? What is your name? Nolan. Norman, <clears throat> Norman that's, that's a very good question. It's a practical one, and it's the sort of question that I, I would pray for. The first thought I have is that I am a monk, so I gave you examples from the life of a monastery because that's all I know. But I have lived in a family, you know, I've lived with my parents for a long time. And I have heard hundreds of confessions of married people. 
And then, you know, I know wonderful people like Deacon Mark and so on. God will always provide what you need in your own context. If you are married, then that is your obedience. That is your monastery. And in that monastery, you have a role. And part of that role is to be very keenly, acutely aware of the needs of everyone else. The more you are obedient to them, not in the sense of, you know, you have your children and they can step on you. That's, that's failing them as a parent. You have to parent them. You have to lead the way. But you have to be acutely aware of their needs so that even before they fall, you've already given them the tools for them not to fall. When I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do, honestly, I, I say my prayers and then I just look at the faces of everyone and I know that one is a bit under the weather. That one is a bit angry for some reason. That one is maybe a bit too withdrawn inside. The other one is a bit too happy. And that's not good either because it exposes you to other things. And then I have to immediately make myself whatever each of them needs me to be. I would very much like to be able to do other things, to do the things that I think I need to be for my own good. But that's not the role that God has given me. I have to be obedient while I'm still their abbot. And that's what you have to do in your own family. You are obedient because you basically forget about yourself. You, the, the wording of the fathers is you empty yourself of yourself in order to help them live the life that they should live. And that is extremely painful, and that will put you on a cross, your own family cross. And I'm sure there are so many other ways. For people who are alone in the world, there may be a struggle with that loneliness. There may be an illness. There may be the struggle of those people who live around them, to whom they have dedicated their lives. I actually know, again from confession, people who have never had a family, have never really wanted it, but they not, neither had a vocation for the, the monastery. And they ended up being these people who, from, from morning until two, three in the next morning, they keep on working for others. It's like they don't exist. I look at them and I'm in awe. These people don't exist. They, they, they don't have a self. They are whatever you need to be. You, you get in touch with them and their first question is, how are you? Are you all right? What do you need? What can I do to help you? And it's not something done you know, in a demonstrative sort of way. It's who they've become. If you ask them about them, themselves, they are a bit taken aback because they don't quite know. They haven't considered the question. Hello. So my question is sort of, as you said, um, doing God's will. When we're in this world, there's a lot of noise when we have decisions. And a lot of the decisions can have virtues attached. I'll use the example, if I want to take a new job, I may say, well, if I get more money, I can provide for my family, I can contribute to my community. If I don't take the job, I can help my wife with the children more, I can be at home or I can quit my job and go be a volunteer somewhere and really give back. And how do we know which, which answer, what, what way to go? Because they all seem in the moment to us virtuous, but yes. some may be better than others. No, they aren't. <clears throat> they are just, just as valid. And again, because you are talking about the context of a married life, my first thought would be, even before you talk to your spiritual father, you have to talk to your spouse. Because if you go forward and your spouse is not with you, the pressure that you put on that unity that you've been blessed to become through a sacrament might actually break the sacrament. So if you end up making millions and you end up building our new church, but you have lost your marriage because of that, you've actually done more damage than good. So in a way, it's connected to the previous question. You have your guides just there by you. You have your, your brakes just there by your side. If your wife is able and willing and of the same mind to go forward with you, glory be to God. If not, then you already know the answer. And regarding children and so on, it's up to you. I mean, yes, a lot of money may provide for a much better education, but 
I mean, again, you cannot generalize, but also a lot of money comes with a lot of temptations. A much simpler, a much more quieter life, especially in those first years of their lives, I think would provide them with a wealth that they cannot buy later on. They will have to face the world anyway. They will have to get their hands dirty because this is the world, the world that we built for them. But if you give them 10, 14 years of peace and quiet and, and a real childhood and real values, they will be so shaped, so, f so well founded on those virtues and those principles that they might actually survive this world without losing their faith or their salvation. So I would personally always, if I were married, I would always look to my spouse for the first guidance. And then if we can't decide between the two of us, go to your priest. I mean, a lot of people, this is one of the most common things I receive in an email, people asking if I could be a spiritual father to them, which is the most ridiculous thing. Because it's not like a contract. You don't send a file attached to an email. I sign it, scan it, and I send it back, and it's done. You build your spiritual father. Any priest can be your spiritual father. And you build him up through the prayers you're doing. You tell Christ in your personal prayer, Christ, I need you now in my life. And this is the mouth through which please speak to me. And then when you approach that priest, you don't have to tell him you've done this. You make your confession, you go forward with your question. And that priest, I'm here to give witness for that, will say things that go even against his own better judgment because they come from somewhere else. But that's what the ancient ones, the fathers of the, of the desert, for instance, meant when they said that it's the spiritual children who give birth to their spiritual fathers. So you can, once you get to an agreement to your spouse, you can entrust it all to Christ and then go and hear his words from your spiritual father or confessor. I, I'm astounded at these questions. Um, so I'm asking for my sister who couldn't be here because she's very ill. And her first question was, how do I find a spiritual father? And which you basically answered. And then her second one was, um, when does the desire to be in the church and present for the sacraments conflict with family obligations and the need for time in or presence with the family? Is there ever a point where it can be imbalanced or where one takes prominence over the other? Which you're kind of going in that direction anyway. Yeah. See, it's something that is so personal. <clears throat> it's something so personal to that particular family, to that particular unit, that to just offer a general answer would actually be dangerous. Because even if you spend all the time in the world with them, the problem is that if you don't spend that time with Christ in you, then you are going to be represented by your own weaknesses. You may spend time with them, <clears throat> but if you haven't communed, if you don't have the living God in you through partaking of his body and his blood, sooner or later, the version of you that is going to be present with them is going to do more damage than if you are not present and you go to church to commune. Because we can be dreadful human beings to the people who love us most and whom we love most. And we can fail them miserably. I, I, I know that. I've done that. So I think there's a balance there. If, if you notice that the bad you is moving in, then let them be upset and go and place Christ here. I think we're one or two more. So uh, This kind of goes back to your comment about the flowers. So... Um, I don't know how to phrase this better than this, but how do you ask why with humility or in a, in a spirit of obedience? Because sometimes the whys have to be asked. You know, like I, like I work as an engineer and sometimes someone will ask me something that, to, to do something, you know, my management or whatever, that doesn't make any sense to me. And sometimes it's because I know something they don't. 
you know, and I can say, hey, there's a problem here. But if I don't know what their reasoning is, sometimes it's like, oh, no, no, I already accounted for that, you know. So, so like, do you kind of understand what I'm saying? I understand exactly, yeah. <clears throat> and I think the problem is that you're trying, not you personally, we all do that, but you are mixing the spiritual life with secular life. So what I, the examples I've given so far to you is of obedience within a, mon a monastery, and monastic life is a sacrament of itself. It's not counted now in our contemporary theology with the, forgive me, with the sacraments of the church, but centuries ago it was a sacrament of the church. And the other example is a marriage, the two becoming one. So that is the safe context where you can apply a spiritual principle. In a secular world, you have other means of, of making it work. I would not, if I were employed in a secular job, I would definitely not be obedient to my boss. I mean, you know what I mean? I wouldn't put my boss yeah, in a spiritual way, yes. Don't mix the two, because what will happen is you're going to apply a good principle, like obedience, onto the wrong context, you are going to be badly burned and disappointed, and then you are going to think that all of that was rubbish and none of it is real. You know, Christ doesn't say for nothing that we should be wise as serpents while still preserving our dove-like innocence. Deacon Mark is telling us it's time for lunch. Hallelujah.